Welcome to this next installment of our series on a Catholic view of the end times. In this video, we'll begin our biblical wrap-up of the Olivet Discourse. We'll learn about what happened to Jerusalem in 70 AD, compare it to Christ's words in the Discourse, and draw out some important spiritual lessons. Join us and explore the mystery of the end times. We're nearing the end of our walkthrough of Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, a set of verses futurists read like a playbook for the end times. Many futurists assert the discourse is a future prophecy about the end of the world that promises a great tribulation for Christians. In contrast, the Catholic Church's historical understanding is that the Olivet Discourse is primarily a prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, with the Great Tribulation being the three and a half year war between the Romans and the Jews. In our last video, we looked at the phrase about the shortening of days for the sake of the elect. We noted that Church Fathers identified the elect to include both Christians and Jews. And the phrase's allusion to the flood of Noah opened up a deeper spiritual meaning. Christ had sent a spiritual Noah's Ark to Christians in the form of a shortening of the broader persecution of Christians orchestrated by Jewish and Roman leadership, and sent a sign to flee Jerusalem before the Great Tribulation. But the spiritual Ark that God would send to the Jews was one you would never expect. In this video, we'll look at the destruction of Jerusalem and ask three questions about it. Number one, what caused Jerusalem's downfall? Number two, how does this event compare to Christ's predictions in the Olivet Discourse? Number three, what spiritual lessons can we draw from this event? Let's address our first question, what caused Jerusalem's downfall? If you follow our videos, you may remember that in 66 AD, a radical group of anti-Roman Jews called Zealots under the leadership of Eleazar ben Simon, advocated the overthrow of Roman authority and sought to establish an independent political kingdom. Eleazar attempted to provoke a war with Rome by assuming control of the Jerusalem temple and cutting off the sacrifices of foreigners in the temple. These included sacrifices offered for the Roman Emperor Nero. The historian Josephus noted that this began the three and a half year war the Great Tribulation between the Romans and the Jews. This infuriated Nero, who in response sent his commander Cestius Gallus to quell the Zealot Rebellion. After cornering the Zealots in the temple, Cestius Gallus inexplicably retreated from the city, leading to his unexpected defeat by the Zealots. The Zealots saw their unexpected victory as an assurance of God's protection and vowed the destruction of the Roman forces. On hearing of Cestius Gallus' defeat, Nero decided that he would subdue the Jewish people entirely and sent his most capable general Vespasian to conquer all of Judea. From 66 AD to 68 AD, Vespasian led a systematic assault on the entire region of Judea, conquering every anti-Roman Jewish stronghold. Josephus records over 100,000 killed or captured during this period. In June of 68 AD, Vespasian approached the city of Jerusalem, but with great reluctance. The Roman Empire had all but admitted that Jerusalem was an impregnable fortress. Built on seven hills and fortified by multiple walls, Jerusalem had been designed to outlast any enemy. In addition to a natural water source, tradition claimed that Jerusalem had seven years of food supplies to sustain its population in case of siege. But before he could begin his assault, Vespasian received word that the childless Emperor Nero had committed suicide, leaving the Roman Empire without a successor. Vespasian pulled most of his troops from Judea and returned to Rome to deal with the power vacuum that Nero's death had caused. It would be nearly a year and a half before Roman troops returned to complete their siege, but the horror that befell the city of Jerusalem began during their absence, for within its walls, Jerusalem was in the midst of a civil war. With the zealots in control of the temple after the defeat of Cestius Gallus, Eleazar had sought to lead the Jews against Rome and establish an independent kingdom of Judea. 
most of the Jews living in Jerusalem were moderates who wanted to maintain peace with Rome and restore the temple to their control. Led by the high priest Ananias ben Ananias, the moderates managed to contain Eleazar zealots within the temple. But then a rival zealot usurper to Eleazar named John of Giscala came onto the scene. John was a military commander who had ambitions to be the one to lead the Jews against the Romans. John acted as a double agent, gaining the trust of the moderates who appointed John as their ambassador to the zealots. Using his position as ambassador, John deceived Eleazar and the zealots by falsely accusing the moderate leaders of secretly conspiring with Vespasian to destroy them. John pledged his military support to the zealot cause. In fear of this supposed moderate alliance with Vespasian, Eleazar sent a desperate plea of assistance to another anti-Roman group called the Idumeans. The Idumeans traveled to Jerusalem, joined the zealot forces now led by John, and killed the high priest and moderate leaders, achieving dominance in the city. But later, the Idumeans discovered John's deception, repented of their actions against the high priest and moderate leaders, and turned against the zealots. Fearing the growing zealot presence and chaos within the city, the remaining moderates made the desperate decision to invite Simon bar Jorah into the city to further contain the zealots. Simon bar Jorah was the leader of anti-Roman Jews called the Sicarii. Simon raised a formidable populist army in the Judean region, promising freedom from slavery for those that followed him. Simon Barjora's entry would accelerate the city's ruin because Simon wanted to be the one to lead the Jews against Rome. Simon saw John of Giscala as his rival in this regard. Eleazar and many zealots, also discerning John's ambition, split off from John and maintained control of the temple. The armies of these three factions thus began fighting one another within the city walls. Both John's anti-Roman zealots and Simon's Sicarii wanted to avoid a prolonged siege and force a confrontation with Roman forces. To achieve this end, zealot and Sicarii militants threatened or put to the sword any inhabitant of Jerusalem that refused to fight against Rome. Many innocent Jews died as a result. To gain a strategic advantage over one another, the zealots and Sicarii set fire to their rivals' food stores. It was through this destruction of rival food stores that Jerusalem suddenly found its food supplies exhausted. After Vespasian eventually assumed control as Roman emperor, he sent his troops under the command of his son Titus to begin the siege of Jerusalem in April of 70 AD. According to Josephus, over one million would finally perish in the siege of Jerusalem. Yet up to a third of those casualties were due to infighting and starvation by the time Titus reached Jerusalem. Famine continued to rack the city for five more months until Titus finally breached the walls and entered the city of Jerusalem in August of 70 AD. Inside, the armies of Rome were aghast at what they discovered. Tens of thousands of bodies filled the streets too innumerable to bury. Hungry rebels staggered from house to house, desperately searching for food. Survivors sustained themselves on grass and leather. And evidence of cannibalism was discovered, including a woman gone mad from hunger who had eaten her own infant son. With Jerusalem too weak to defend itself, Roman troops quickly overcame the remaining anti-Roman Jewish resistance, killed any armed citizens, and took full control of the city. After subduing the city, the Romans ransacked the temple and set it on fire. The fire spread unimpeded, destroying nearly every building in the city. Over one million perished in the civil war, siege, and fires of Jerusalem. The Romans completed their siege of Jerusalem by pulling down every stone of the temple complex until no building was left standing. The Great Tribulation was over. Jesus' prediction in Matthew 24, verse 2, had come true. Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. 
With these historical details in mind, let us address our second question, namely, how do the events of Jerusalem compare to Christ's prophecy in the Olivet Discourse? Jesus warned his disciples of false messiahs, beginning in verse 23. Then, if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, Behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. If we read carefully, we notice Jesus gave specific details of at least two figures. One was a false messiah who people would claim was in the inner rooms. The phrase inner rooms was a Jewish technical term that referred to a specific area within the temple. The figure that church fathers identified with this description was Eleazar ben Simon, the zealot who cut off foreign sacrifices and maintained control of the temple throughout the war. Eleazar played the part of the false messiah, a political leader that advocated the overthrow of Roman authority, assuring the people of God's protection. In contrast, Jesus, the true Messiah, came to establish a spiritual kingdom, not a political one. Jesus warned of a second false Messiah, who people would claim was in the wilderness. And this is a good description for Simon Barjora, as he had raised a formidable populist army in the Judean wilderness region, promising political freedom from slavery to his followers. In contrast, Jesus came to free us from the slavery of sin that affects all of humanity. And Jesus contrasts his second coming at the end of time with those false messiahs in verse 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Unlike those false messiahs, Christ's second coming will be like lightning. And lightning is an appropriate metaphor because lightning appears suddenly without warning and is visible to all. We will discuss what Christ actually teaches us about his second coming in a future video. One of the grimmest statements in the discourse is verse 28. Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. As discussed in a previous video, the Roman legions flew under the banner of the eagle. The Greek word for eagles can also be translated as vultures. Both eagles and vultures in Israel are carrion birds or birds that feed on dead things. And scavengers such as eagles and vultures often surround a wounded animal waiting for the victim's death before they swoop in to feed. And the body that the Roman eagles would gather around to consume was Jerusalem itself. It wasn't primarily the military might of the Roman army that caused Jerusalem's ultimate downfall. Jerusalem was dying of infighting and famine before the Romans breached its walls. Which leads us to our final question. What spiritual lessons can we draw from this event? Let us begin with a spiritual conclusion one must never make. This event in history has been used as a polemic against the Jews throughout history by so-called Christians who have argued that the destruction of Jerusalem was God's condemnation against the Jews collectively for their crucifixion of Christ. The Catholic Church emphatically rejects that viewpoint. Any Christian would do well to meditate on the official teaching of the Catholic Church in her Catechism, paragraphs 597 to 598. Neither all Jews indiscriminately at that time nor Jews today can be charged with the crimes committed during Christ's passion. The Jews should not be spoken of as rejected or accursed as if this followed from Holy Scripture. The church is concerned about the salvation of all souls, and she insists that all sinners, whether Jew or Gentile, were the authors of Christ's passion. Those that interpret the destruction of Jerusalem as God's judgment against the Jews collectively neither understand the event historically nor biblically. And that point is sometimes rooted in the idea that the Old Covenant, 
also translated as Old Testament, is something to be disposed of or rejected. But that's never been the teaching of the Catholic Church. The Old Covenant did pass away, but it was resurrected in Christ. Christ came not to abolish the Law and the Prophets, but to fulfill them. The Catechism of the Catholic Church reminds us that the word Catholic means both universal and according to the fullness. And we should remember the Great Tribulation began with Eleazar's cutting off of foreign sacrifices, foreign access to the worship of God. We as Catholics are called not to cut off, but to invite all, including those that still faithfully keep the Old Covenant, into the fullness of the New. The Church is called the New Jerusalem from that perspective. A spiritual lesson we can draw is that Christ did warn his disciples of false messiahs. The tragedy that killed many innocent Jews in Jerusalem was caused primarily by infighting between groups of factions led by false messiahs who advocated the destruction of their political enemies and promised political solutions to Jerusalem's problems. John of Giscala, Eleazar ben Simon, and Simon bar Jura were false Christs, or what the Church calls Antichrists. And while we'll learn about Antichrists in a future video, the Catechism in her section on the Antichrist, paragraph 676, warns modern Christians to be wary of political forms of secular messianism, or political movements, or forms of government that promise solutions to humanity's problems apart from Christ. Humanity's problems are ultimately rooted in humanity's fallen human nature. We can't save ourselves apart from God. In contrast to those false messiahs, Jesus, the true Christ, gave himself in love for those who hated him. The early Christians did not try to bring down the Roman Empire through political means. They instead brought down the Roman Empire to their knees by converting them through the gospel. Let us also consider the enigmatic verse we looked at in our last video. And if those days, meaning the days of the Great Tribulation, had not been shortened, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Commentators in church history believe the days were shortened for those Jews caught up in the destruction of Jerusalem. But what you would never expect is that they identified the Roman general Titus as the spiritual ark which God sent to shorten the days of the tribulation. That might sound unbelievable at first. After all, Titus led the Roman assault on Jerusalem and oversaw the city's final destruction. Titus was no friend to the Jews. But he was well aware of the situation within the city as he stood outside its walls. One can imagine that if instead of pressing his siege, Titus had simply waited outside the walls while the famine and infighting that ravaged the city ran its course, there would have been no survivors, or as Jesus put it, no human being would be saved. And although Titus sold 40,000 rebel captives into slavery, non-rebels that surrendered to Titus were set free. God used his instrument, the Roman general Titus, to shorten the days of the Great Tribulation and preserve his elect. God saves his elect, but in sometimes unexpected ways. And that's what the story of salvation history is about. God coming to save us in unexpected ways, especially from ourselves. When we study the real Great Tribulation, we find that Jerusalem's primary enemies came not from outside its walls, but from within. Understanding the church is the new Jerusalem, the fathers of the church warn us that false prophets and teachers will always attack the church from within. False teachers are often hard to discern from true ones. Christians must nurture a proper spiritual disposition in order to distinguish between them. End time alarmists often stoke fear in Christians. Those in fear often invite their messages in. But the Christian message is not one of fear. And fear is not a Christian disposition. To distinguish truth from falsity, we must nurture a proper spiritual disposition. We should remember that the Great Tribulation of Jerusalem 
began in the temple, and that the Catholic Church teaches that the true temple of God is in the soul of every baptized Christian. And reflecting on that, we come to the spiritual conclusion that we probably should be less concerned about the disposition of things outside our walls and most concerned about the disposition of our souls. For those of you following along closely in your Bibles, you may have noticed we haven't covered those passages about the sun darkening, the stars falling from the sky, and the Son of Man coming in the clouds. In our next video, we'll focus on those, perhaps the most famously misunderstood verses in the Gospel of Matthew. So if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our channel to receive our latest videos as we publish them by clicking on the subscribe button. And don't forget to like, comment, or share this video if you found it helpful. God bless.